Well, uh, I'd like to start out today. I have a couple of little plants here. Can you see these? This is sad. This is a sad one. Sad little plant. <laughs> now, I bought both of these plants at the same time. Both of these plants were actually sitting side by side in the little tray that they probably have been growing together in since the beginning of their little life. So they both looked identical. Actually, you couldn't tell them apart when I brought them home. As you can see, this plant here looks a little different than this one over here. It's very, very weepy here, <laughs> very hangy. <laughs> This plant here, I made sure that it had plenty of sunlight. I made sure that I watered it. I, remember, I made sure that it wasn't too cold or didn't get any frostbite. I made sure that it was well taken care of. As you can see, it's doing quite well. It's, it's blooming, it smells good, looks perky. Beautiful little plant. Now this plant here, I didn't take care of this plant. When I brought it home, I put it in the back room in the dark. Didn't allow it to see any sunlight at all. I didn't water it. I neglected it. I just ignored it and left it in the back closet. And over a period of time, you could see how this little plant here began to deteriorate quickly. The leaves started to get brownish. The blossoms started to sag, and it got to the point where it almost looks like there's no life in it at all. But yet they were both exactly the same when I brought them home. This one I cared for dearly, took care of it. This one I totally neglected it. These plants represent my wife. When I first brought my wife home, she looked like this one right here. She was perky, she looked good, she was full of blossom. She was a beautiful plant. But after 30 years of living with me, this is what she ended up like. A sad story. Now, the whole time, my wife was being transformed from this to this, living with me, I never missed a Sabbath service. I never missed a weekly Bible study. Even if I was tired, I drove home, got in the car, drove back out, went to Bible study. I never missed a holy day. I never missed a Feast of Tabernacles. And not only that, I've even though I was doing all this other stuff, I was still very active in the church. In fact, I was looked at as a pillar in the congregation. All the time, this is the condition my wife was, got into, because of how I neglected her. Now, at the end of it all, God says that because of the way you lived and the way you operated, I'm going to either give you five cities or ten cities to be over. What's God going to say to me when I come forward to him with the one person that had been put into my charge under my leadership as a Christian? How many cities is God going to give me with this? I know this may sound melodramatic to you, but it's not. God is looking at our life and seeing how we're behaving, how we're treating our wives. And our wives are the ones that show us the condition of our marriage. You know that? When I was in the church and being a pillar in the church, according to me, our marriage was great, didn't have a problem. But you know, 
My position or my opinion about how good my marriage is didn't depend on my opinion. It depended on my wife's opinion of what was going on. I never let her let anybody know what was I was doing to her. I told her to be quiet, don't embarrass me, don't ridicule me, make sure that you protect me. Don't ever let anybody know what I'm doing to you. You know, if this, if this uh, plant could talk when I first brought it home, after a day or two, it would say, I need some water. I need to be watered. But I ignored it. And as time went on, it would get louder and say, please, I need water. I need you to take care of me. I'm, I'm not thriving. I'm dying internally. Inside, I feel like I am dying. Can you please take care of me? But because she didn't have a voice, I ignored it. You know, it was really hard for me because I, when I brought these two plants home, they were identical. And I had to watch this one die a slow death. And I knew it was my fault because I didn't do what I needed to do to take care of this plant. Well, my wife is the same way. And thankfully, my wife, because she's such a fighter, I don't give and up she, easy. she didn't care about my pride and my ego. She threatened me. When she was looking <laughs> like this and knew that our marriage was about dead and she was dying inside, she said, either we get some help or I'm going to go to the ministry and tell them that we need help. She used my, she used my pride and my ego against me. <laughs> and I said, no, you're not going to do that. Okay, just to keep you shut up, or, well, let's go to the seminar. So that's what got me to a seminar. But if she wouldn't have stood up to me and made that requirement on me, Our marriage would have been dead after 30 years it would have been gone and you know the pride my pride and my ego would have allowed that to happen just so I wouldn't be exposed to not being taking care of her I would have allowed that to happen I would have not only destroyed our marriage it would have destroyed our children and their life because they would have saw the destruction of the family you know, the scripture say, says the curse of the father or the sins of the father are carried on to the third and the fourth generation. Here's what happens. When the head of the family does not do what he's required to do by God, he not only destroys their marriage, but he destroys their children's lives as well. And that's what goes on time and time and time again in God's church. You know, or in any Christian church. I know it's sobering, but this is a serious thing. You know, marriage is, is God's whole plan for man in a microcosm. That's how our life is supposed to be. We're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to love our children. We're supposed to show them how to love each other, how to grow up, how to be good Christian family so that they can pass it on to their generation. And that's what God wants. He wants godly seed. But you know, it's a subject that is, it's really not taken that serious. It really isn't. People think that marriage is just, uh, you know, that we're just up here to help you to have a happy little life much more than that it's much bigger than that because you know Satan says he's going to and fro within the earth seeking who he may devour what is he looking for looking for somebody who shows up at church every Sabbath keeps every holy day he's looking about he's looking to see what kind of life they're living so this is important this is much bigger than just a marriage well, it's about life lived privately. 
This That's is right. public. This is a public life, but it's about life lived privately. Mm -hmm. That's where Satan attacks. Yeah. That's where he goes. You know, a chain is always is only as strong as its weakest link. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. This was my weakness. This is what Satan went after. Satan is going to be turned loose on this world, and it's, as you can look out in the world right now, you can see it happening all over. And we think we're on solid ground, that we're good, because we're doing church, but yet our marriages are a wreck. Now, when, when my wife made me go to this, this um, marriage seminar, this particular seminar taught men how to be Christ-like leaders. The whole thing was directed at the men, not the woman at all, the man. And the reason he, oh boy, I didn't even turn that on. The reason he did that is because the man, the husband, is the head of the wife. You know, when I heard that, I used to hear that in church, like, hey, I'm the boss. <laughs> She's got to do what I tell her to do. I'm cool. <laughs> I'm the boss. No, he says the man is the head of the wife. That means the man is the responsible one. The one is going to have to give an account for the condition of his marriage. It's the man who God is going to come looking for to give an account. And so this whole seminar, three-year seminar, uh, taught men how to be Christ-like to their wife. And the reason they focused on the man is because the wife follows her man. She's a responder. If the man is doing what he's supposed to do and being a Christ-like leader, the wife will respond to that. So she, he doesn't have to teach her anything. She can, she can just respond to my Christ-like leadership. Whether I am leading her in a loving as Christ would, or if I don't, she's still going to respond one, one to the other. Unfortunately, I was not imaging Christ in my marriage. I was imaging Satan, the destroyer. And this was the end result. So I wanted to use this just to give you a, a word picture of what's going on in marriages. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. This is what's happening in our marriages, in the churches, in, in, in Christianity. I don't want to put it in our own church, but the whole of Christianity, marriage is falling apart. Divorce is as high in a in Christian world as it is out in the secular world. What a shame. The very thing that God put in place to show his plan to mankind is being destroyed. Not because men are bad or that they're just mean or they're, it's because we just were never been taught. So I had, after three years of going through that class, I have been applying what I have been learning to my wife. And it's taken 20 years to take her from this back to this again. This is what my wife looks like. And she's standing right here next to me. So if I was lying, she'd kick me in the shin. <laughs> if, I, if he was lying, I'd tell you. She would. So, so did I, was it an easy trip? No. no. It was, there was a lot of flesh burning for 20 <laughs> years to, get, to put my flesh to death enough to turn and love her the way she needs to be loved, the way God asked or instructed the man to love his wife. So we're going to keep sharing. We've got, a, we've got a ton of information that we want to share with you over the next months. whatever months, <laughs> what, whatever you allow us to do. We certainly don't want to push this on you, but we have been so helped by what we have learned that we want to share it with you all. Well, and I, w I wanted to say this, is, uh, this was our life. It was 30 years of a marriage in a tank, and then God took us out of that place and, and restored us. That, that's the picture of the flowers. He restored our life together. He restored my life. 
And so this, this was answered prayer. Where we got help was answered prayer. I didn't think God was ever going to answer my prayer. I thought he was deaf and deaf and, and not willing to help me. But there's a reason for it, and that we'll bring up much later. But uh, I just want to say to you, you don't have to agree with us. You don't even have to like what we're saying. It's our experience, it, it, and we're offering it to you as a perspective, as something that you can consider for your life. But, and, and I wanted to say, he didn't beat me. He wasn't an alcoholic. He didn't do anything that was horrendous that we would think in society was a terribly bad thing. He was just neglectful, and he wasn't a bad person and a mean person. He's actually, when we get further in today's teaching, you know, he's this easygoing, pleasant kind of a guy, but he had not been taught. He didn't see it modeled in his, in his family's home. He didn't see it modeled by his father. He wasn't taught, so there was no education, no uh, example was given to him. And so we both come into a marriage with no knowledge and no understanding, and somehow this has just all gone to work miraculously together. And it doesn't. It takes education, and that's what we had to get was education, and this is what God gave us. So we're offering it to you, what we learned, what repaired our life, what repaired our marriage, for your consideration. Okay. So. You want to go over some of the... Well, we thought we'd remind you from last time, since it's been several weeks since we spoke last time, to just kind of uh, think about just very shortly here about what it was we'd spoke about last time. And uh, I want to remind you of the scripture in 1 Peter 3, 7, and I'm going to read it out of my Bible. Mine's like the novel Bible. I have other academic kinds of Bibles, but I kind of prefer this one. Uh, it's 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. If you don't treat her as you should, your, prayer, your prayers will not be heard. But what I wanted to focus on here and what last time's uh, message was about the differences between men and women, we want to continue that. We want to finish that up today because we have deeper, harder things to address as we go along. Mm -hmm. But I want to focus on treat her with understanding as you live together. In other words, dwell with your wife in an understanding way. There's nowhere in the Bible, we've looked it up, where it asks a wife to dwell with her husband in an understanding way. And the reason is, is because God made the woman relational and we're going to be out there rooting around to figure out what makes this relationship work. When, we, when I started seeing things going south and, and not working, him not hearing me, him not understanding me, I was always at a bookstore looking for some kind of book that was going to make this marriage work. So, and then I came from a place of no father, no brother, so I assumed I just didn't know anything about men. And so I was constantly out there looking to gain that understanding. So the direction is to men to dwell with your wife in an understanding way. So with that said, remember we had the dollar bill and you had to get on one side or the other of the dollar bill. And so about that was a, about perspective that the man coming around to seeing what it is that the wife sees on that side of the dollar bill or on her perspective. The other thing was we talked about circles and ladders and how women uh, live within the, the framework of circles. We want to include, we want to bring everybody in. Men live in the framework of ladders. They're always evaluating where they fit on that ladder as compared to other people. Uh, the other thing we discussed was the salad bowl versus the compartments. And that was a big one in our relationship. Was that, did you guys find that helpful when we explained that? Helped you to understand how the wife thinks, how the husband thinks? Yeah, good. That, you know, all of my stuff, my daily stuff, my weekly, monthly stuff is all in this bowl and it's all touching each other. And I needed someone to sort out my little napkins in there. And then, um, well, that was, that's a refresher from back then. So I want to pass out, or have somebody pass Here, out. I'll do it, yeah. Um, here's a picture he's going to be passing We've out. We've got a picture of a... 
let me put this here so they can see a, of young, a, of a young lady, a young Victorian lady with a little joker thing. I want you to take a look at that. You guys can. So this is all about perspective. Look at the pretty young lady there on the picture. This is about perspective, so you can. Ooh. There you go. There you go. Wayne, yeah. don't forget Don and. Oh Glenn. yeah. Let me get this guy back here. Okay. I don't know if we have enough of everything we printed out, but if we don't, yeah, we give, if we miss anybody, just let me know and we'll make copies for you. <clears throat> okay, do you uh, see the pretty young girl there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, look real close at that picture. What else do you see? The old tag. Hmm? The old tag. You see anybody else there? Do you see a, an old lady? You know, when I had this printed up the other day and I the lady that did the printing, I said, uh, look at this picture, what do you see? She said, I see a young girl. I said, you don't see an older person in that picture either? No, 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 I just see a young person. And when I actually pointed it out to her, she was like shocked. It's like it jumped off the page at her because she hadn't seen that before. And you see how that can switch back and forth? And it's all about perspective. And that's what men have to do with their wives. When, they, when they're trying to describe something, there's always maybe something there that you're not seeing quite yet, but if you look at it hard long enough, you'll see there's something different in the picture. You, I see some raised eyebrows. Can you see it yet? You don't, you don't see the old lady? <laughs> you don't see the old lady? Here. You see it? Here's her nose. Here's her mouth. Here's her chin. She's got like a or hair or a scarf. <laughs> Here's her eye. Here's her bangs with a feather in it. Can you see it yet? We still got some. <laughs> Look at this. Okay. So it's all see, about this perspective is the nose in a of marriage. The lady, of the older lady. Okay. okay. So it's like an old witch here. I'm not, and here's her eye right here on each side. Oh, oh there it is, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it amazing how once you spot it, it's like... <laughs> it's amazing to me. You yeah. got it? Did yeah. you get it? Okay. It's amazing to me because every time I look at the picture, I only see the young girl, and I have to force myself to see... The choker is, is the, the mouth. mouth of the old yeah. hag. <laughs> <laughs> you see it now? Yeah. See how obvious that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big nose. So that's kind of how it is in a marriage. It's about really focusing and trying to see that other side that other side because there's always another side there's always another perspective because we're all human and we come into this life with our backgrounds so we want to um, begin with the next the finishing part of the what are our differences between us and these things are can be used with people who aren't married and just amongst people in a church so, do you want to start with the marketing? Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, when men start out uh, dating their wives, they're in what we call marketing mode. You know, we're, uh, we're out there, we want to impress her. It's like we're on, we're on a hunt. We're going to go out, we're going to bag her, yep. going to shoot her and drag her home. Yep. So everything we do is to... Uh, to uh, uh, well, he wined and dined me. <laughs> basically <laughs> to impress her to impress I, everything the, is about impressing the wife the problem is the wife or the the the, 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 the girl then. is in ecstasy mode okay so uh, i just thought he was he uh, was calling me and he was taking me to dinner and i was big into foreign films with subtitles <laughs> And he would go with me. He, I would say, "Well, let's let's go to Berkeley and do you know whatever." And you he probably would remember go. that from the last session. Yeah. So he would go and do all these things and call me and dine me and whatever. And yeah. so I assumed, based on that behavior, 
That was me. It was going to be <laughs> all along, pretty oh, much. Oh, boy. <laughs> Did I have her fooled, right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't get, because I didn't see that modeled ever at all in my life. I didn't have an older brother. So my assumption was, if this is how you're treating me now, then that's how I get treated. Yeah. So uh, anybody is out here dating right now? The ladies, heads up about that, okay? The guy's in marketing mode, so don't let him fool you. <laughs> and so I was all Twitter-pated and so, oh, in love with him, and I didn't, didn't bother to look at, well, his background and, and how he was raised and all the things that should have put, you know, red flags up you type of thing. You were blinded by your ecstasy. I was blinded by ecstasy. <laughs> ecstasy. And we see it all the time. You see, you can see it all the time when you're younger. Or it, doesn't even, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you are getting remarried at age 60, the man he's, is this He's thing. on a hunt. It's this thing he's about the men. They're marketing you. They're marketing you. <laughs> okay. And then um, the next one, and we kind of hit this before, is the difference between uh, the man being mechanical, the woman being relational. That's just the way we're made. God made us relational. He made men mechanical and logical. And we had used other uh, examples, but yeah. one I want to use this time to describe this is going out to dinner. Uh, I want to go out to dinner, not particularly to eat. Well, these days it's because I don't really like cooking, but uh, <laughs> that I want to go out to dinner, but even though I don't like cooking and I want to go out to dinner because we have to eat, I want to go out to dinner because I see it as a relational type of thing. I'm going to get, but back then it was I was going to get dressed up, especially when we had kids and, and someone offered to babysit. Oh, this was, we were going to go on a date, and I'm going to get dressed up, and this whole <laughs> dinner thing was going to be, we're going to sit across from each other, we're going to have that glass of wine, and yeah. we're going to talk, and you know, whatever. <laughs> and he's not yeah. looking at dinner hey, like that. Hey, we're going out to eat. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I'm mechanical. She says, do you want to go out to eat? Let's go eat. I wasn't thinking any of that stuff that she was yeah. thinking. It was just totally I was thinking functional. Totally relationship. It was all about having a relationship at this dinner table. And, and we go out to restaurants now and we look at tables and people at them and it's really funny how we can observe exactly what's going on at that table. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the next one is men, well it's like when he showed the flowers how they need to be watered, they need to have sunlight, they need to have everything that makes a plant grow. Men need respect like air. Yep. And I and a woman needs value and acceptance for services, services rendered. rendered. Yep. And he never, in the beginning, because he didn't know, and I, didn't, I couldn't describe it and help him to understand, he didn't, I did not feel valued. I did not feel cherished. I did, almost didn't even recognize the word in my life. But this is a subject that requires a lot of in-depth discussion, and so we are just mentioning it here because it is a difference. I don't need respect. I don't live for respect. I, it's not the air that I breathe, but the air I breathe is value and acceptance. I need value and acceptance. And I need to be respected. You know, if I could care less about love and romance. I have to feel respected. That's the air that I breathe. And that's why God says that a woman is to respect her husband, because that's what he needs. But there's a way to get that. We still got a hum going here. Can yeah. you get that out a little bit? But this is, a, this is a very lengthy, deep point that we need to spend time on, and that is over here. Yeah. So, but there is one thing, uh, the, one of the things that we want to discuss today, and mm. I need these passed yeah. out in the bag. All right, there, I got it. Up there. Um, I want to talk about the temperaments. We all are born with the temperament. And I want to go to the scripture, uh, Psalms 139. I'm, a, I'm going to read Psalms 139, 1 mm. through 6. Oh, I got a bunch of blanks here. 
O oh Lord, mm -hmm. you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up, you know my every thought when far away. You chart the, pa the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. You know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. You both proceed and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. And I'm going down to verse 13. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, and how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious your thoughts about me, O oh God. God made each and every one of us to be exactly who each and every one of us is. And one of the things that we need to understand in a marriage relationship is the difference in our temperaments. And I want to go spend some time on this. So we've passed this out, and so I'm going to ask that you don't read all the pages in the beginning while we're speaking, but that you go to the last page. And this last page here. Yeah, where it's really dark, black and white. When we were having terrible, terrible marriage problems, I was prostrate on the floor begging God to rescue me and help me to understand. And God led me way back then to a Berean Christian bookstore, and I came across a, a book and a set of tapes called After the Wedding Comes the Marriage by Florence Litauer. And I brought that home and I listened to it and it revolutionized my life at that time. I thought it was the whole enchilada that God was gonna give me, he'd answered my prayers. And little did I know it was gonna be a really long journey to get to the whole enchilada. And this was only one step along the way. But this was so valuable in our marriage, so valuable in our family, so valuable between, me, uh, between us and our children that we still to this day, our grand, we've, we've taught this stuff to our grandkids, we talk about it all the time. And it's helped us to understand, it helped me to understand myself so I wasn't so hard on myself. The reason I read that scripture is I want you to understand that you need to embrace all of yourself, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the, the bad and the ugly God's chipping away at. But there's this part of us that God made specific, each of us specifically to be that, to fit in this world of people. And so uh, a lot of people who work for corporations learn this stuff, the temperaments. They either learn it by numbers or they learn it by colors or they learn it by animal names. But this is the original sanguine, choleric, phlegmatic, and melancholy. And um, until I understood who I was, I struggled in our marriage relationship because I wasn't like Wayne. And he struggled with me being who I am because I didn't act like him, I didn't behave like him. And that was part of the killing of yeah. the plant. I thought normal people acted like me. Right. I didn't know. He defined what was normal. He defined <laughs> what was the right perspective. And the fact of the matter is, it was killing me a little bit at a time not to, to embrace and enjoy and celebrate who I am. Uh, I'm gonna go through the choleric because that's what I am. I'm a choleric. I am definitely a type A personality. He's a type B personality. So you can see he's phlegmatic, the easygoing, laid back type of person. So he's wondering why I'm all got my panties in a bunch 90% of the time. I, I'm totally opposite of her. <laughs> right. But you know opposites attract. Right. So it was normal for us to come together because it, it balances us out. I mean, back then he was trying to change me to become him and I could not be changed to become yeah. him. I, well, I tried, but that, that was not God's will in my life. And one of the things I want to point out, like it says strengths on one side and weaknesses on another, I learned that when God says in his word that I need to overcome something, I look at that weakness list 
And those are the things I needed to overcome. Not being passionate, to, from his perspective, he couldn't understand why I always had an opinion. Yeah. How could you always have an opinion about everything? I don't know, because I yeah. just do. But and how come you're so bossy? And how come you're so pushy? Yeah. And, and all of this type okay, of a thing. Can't you just mellow out a little bit? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, when, when I learned this, when we learned this as a family, our kids applied it when they went to YOU. They could understand that friend and that friend. And we, like I said, we still talk about this. Very so valuable, yes. I'm a choleric. So I have these strong strengths. I'm passionate. I'm focused. I'm efficient. I, I'm just skipping through this here. No, don't. Oh, OK. I'm ambitious. I'm passionate. I'm leader-like. I'm focused. I'm efficient. I'm practical. I'm good at planning, good at problem solving, confident, motivating. But uh, it comes across as bossy. A delegator. And so I always rebelled against that. The delegator because part. Because I didn't understand where she was coming from. And I love this usually right. It was a lot of the times. And great <laughs> in an emergency. But I had these weaknesses. But he saw my strengths as weaknesses because my strengths weren't his strengths. And my weaknesses are, and some I can say proudly after 50 years of being baptized, were, I, I can be too aggressive. Mostly domineering, inflexible, <laughs> impatient. That's, uh, I don't pray for patience because God makes yeah. sure I'm going to be yeah. patient. Uh, rude and tactless, argumentative, unable to relax. Oh, that's a big one. Uh, uncomfortable around emotion, low on empathy, discouraged by failures, failures, too busy for people, intolerant, a leader who demands loyalty. I had those. Yeah, I, that was me. I could, yes, all of that. But you know, I want, you to, I want you to own those scriptures that say how God is just in love with you and how much he enjoys you and how he, he created you because he's looking for those strengths in a world that needs strong people in all of these varieties. It's okay to be a choleric woman. I can be a choleric woman and it's okay. I don't have to be a phlegmatic woman and be like him. And he, he doesn't have the right to demand that I change all these weaknesses. God is changing those weaknesses in me. He's working out his work in me that he said he was doing from the beginning. I mean, he certainly has pointed some things out and it's like, yeah, I am that and I do that. And just as an example with me, when he would say, come outside, honey, I want you to see the uh, setting sun, I would go, I'd go like, oh, I gotta go outside and see the setting sun. And I would sit out there and I'd like glance at the well, sun. Well, you'd say, well, I got one more thing to do. I got, because she's so uh, project oriented. She has to get projects done. And so to her, that's what's important. But then I'd go sit out there and I'm like glancing at the sun. And while I'm glancing at the sun, I'm glancing down and I'm thinking, oh, look at the crack in the wall. Oh, the weeds need to be weeded. It was awful. It, it was yeah. awful until I learned to control all of that. And then Wayne's yeah. the phlegmatic. Yeah, I'm the phlegmatic. Uh, this is the more balanced one. Oh, of, yeah, of right. The <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a phlegmatic, this is, this is your strength. You're usually relaxed. You're kind of laid back, easy going. And you're also... Uh, an introvert. See, she's a. I'm an the, extrovert. The sanguine and the choleric are both extroverts. They they like a lot of people around. They like a lot of activity. They like to be in the middle of everything. But your phlegmatic and your melancholy, they're the the introverts. They're the ones that don't like big crowds. They like to be uh, almost alone a lot or in quiet places. They don't need to be around a lot of See, people. See, doing all the time. this type of thing is not particularly distressing to me huh. because I'm extroverted. Doing this for Wayne is oh, <laughs> particularly <painful. laughs> distressing for him because he'd rather sit down on the benches here with you or at the table at lunch and discuss this as a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-five. I'm thinking if I'm going to deliver information, the more the merrier, you know, type of a thing. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, as a phlegmatic, you're usually a more relaxed person. You're not highly driven. Uh, you're quiet and calm. You're content with, uh, with the, they're content with themselves. Uh, we're usually kind, uh, consistent, uh, a steady and a faithful friend. 
accepting, affectionate, diplomatic, peacemaking, rational, curious, observant, and an easy friend maker. So we're real lazy back. We're, we're the mellow ones in the crowd. <laughs> but we have a weakness side too, and this is the side that my wife uh, used to focus on a lot, didn't see the other side, just like I focused on, on her weaknesses instead of her strength. She had a tendency to, to look at my weaknesses, which uh, I'm sometimes shy, I'm fearful of change, I'm prone to laziness, because I'm not driven, you know, hey, I, I'll get it tomorrow, I can, you know, I don't have to get it all today. The sun's coming up tomorrow, I can take care of that later. <laughs> Uh, I'm stubborn. Oh boy, can I be stubborn yes, when I want to? Yes, very. Uh, I've been known to be passive aggressive. <clears throat> a lot. <laughs> uh, I, and very indecisive. Uh, you know, yes. my wife uh, will ask me, well, where do you want to go to dinner? I don't care. Where do you want to go? Or I'll say, do you, I've you, got what, ice cream. Would you like cream. to do this weekend? I, I don't, I, nothing. I, or I don't I'll make. say, do you want chocolate or vanilla ice cream? And he says he doesn't care. I mean, how do you not care about what you're going <laughs> to choose, you know? <laughs> I'm permissive because I'm easy going, sometimes too permissive when I should be a little more um, aggressive, uh, not goal oriented, that's true. You know, I, I don't have to accomplish huge amounts of things every day, but sometimes I can let things go because I'm not, too, uh, not goal oriented. Um, unenthusiastic, I come across as unenthusiastic because I'm kind of laid back and easy going. Uh, although I can be enthusiastic, but it's only on certain things. <laughs> I'm too compromising because I'm a, I'm a peacemaker. You know, I, I'm easy going and laid back. I want, I'm a peacemaker. And sometimes being a peacemaker isn't always good. Sometimes you have to Take affect stand. change. And so that's something I have to balance out in my life. Uh, where am I at here? Undisciplined. Undisciplined? Oh, mm, yeah. <laughs> That's something we can all work on if you're phlegmatic. I, can, I have a tendency, I can be sarcastic with dry humor. Um, I, I get discouraged uh, a lot. And, and he can be discouraging. And I can be discouraging, yeah. Which means I could come up with some wonderful grand idea yes. and he's like, sees the negative to it, so he's discouraging. And I can be non-participative. So you can see. <laughs> before we go, before we go any further, who's, who's a choleric? Who spots himself as a choleric in here? Big one. One, two, three, four, five cholerics. Not, not. not. Oh, you're a phlegmatic? You're like me. Hey, we're good. Okay. Okay, who's, who's, who's a phlegmatic? Can they see themselves as a phlegmatic yet? Okay, that one, two. That one there. Okay. They see how they're... You, you, you're opposites, right? You got a phlegmatic and a choleric together, and you're, Judy. and you're a choleric or a phlegmatic. What are you? Phlegmatic. phlegmatic. I'll bet Keith is a choleric. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Big time. <laughs> what are you, James? Yeah. Well, I don't think we got to him yet. So let's. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, big time. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, the, if you can see that we have a phlegmatic man that was marketing me on a date. So he's going to bag me, and he's got all this easy, wherever you want to go. You want to go to foreign films? I'll take you to foreign films. And then I'm being choleric, so he doesn't, I'm organizing his life, of which he doesn't want to organize. And yeah. so I And was still like, do. Right? Because I, she's good at it. Well, but, I, but in the beginning, yeah. it was the best yeah. thing since sliced bread that I'm organizing his life because mm -hmm. he wasn't organized. And I organized his money and his pockets. I, <laughs> I helped him get on a budget, you know, because he used to get, bring home a paycheck and put the whole thing in his pocket. And, <laughs> and then I don't know what he did with it. But, uh, but when we got married, because he bagged the deer, all of a sudden... I was stuck with a choleric. <laughs> and, and he saw that as bossy and yeah. infringing and whatever. And, I'm, and yeah. I'm wondering where was this pleasant, <laughs> easygoing person that I had um, dated. But um, we have uh, in our family... Well, let's go to the same one. Well, I, I am. Okay. We, we, I, 
I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I have a, a daughter that's phlegmatic. Yeah. <laughs> there we are, being controlling again. Right. So we have phlegmatics and we have cholerics in our family. And I don't want to get into this part, but you do usually have a secondary, and okay. I am I tend to be choleric. Melancholy, our daughter, is okay, phlegmatic so sanguine. Then. But anyways, the sanguine, uh, the strengths are they're sociable people, they're charismatic, they're outgoing. These are, these are the life of the party. You know, right. when you go to a party and you hear the loudest person and you can hear Laughing. their laugh, you can usually hear their laugh across the room. Mm -hmm. that, that's the same one. Go ahead. They're optimistic, they're warm hearted, pleasant, lively, fun, lo lovers, spontaneous, a preventer of dull moments. I mean, you want to invite these people to parties. Yeah. The, it, or if you think you've got some really quiet people. You've got to have a sanguine in the bunch to keep it going. A quick apologizer and an easy friend maker. But they can be impulsive. They're always chronically late. Everyone that I've ever known, it's chronically late. They're, uh, I don't really know what shameless means. I think they're not, they're not easily embarrassed. Not maybe. embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, forgetful, a compulsive talker, uh, too loud, sometimes too happy distractible. I mean, I've seen the sanguine people where they, you're talking to them and then it's, they're on like another subject. They're like, yeah. like a rabbit popped up out of a hole and they're like, what? So they're distractible. Um, not interested in following through with tasks that are yeah. boring. Self-absorbed, an exaggerator, someone who appears unauthentic. It's like they're just overly They're just too happy. Out there. Yeah. And the opposite of that would okay, be... Okay, um, any sanguines in here yet? Right here, got okay. one, got two. A sanguine <laughs> and a phlegmatic together, okay? So he's easy going and you're happy all the time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You get mad. You get mad oh too. yeah, sure yeah. you do. On the, we're talking about on the whole here. Okay. Your general personality. Yeah. And this so helps knowing this stuff with your kids so that we don't like wrestle them into a box to be like ourselves, but they're allowed to be who they are. Mm. And uh, my kid is different. Maybe my son. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I raised him. Hey, yeah. we we got three kids, and every one of them was different. They all we got just about everything here. Right. Okay. Melancholy. And then the melancholy. Their strengths are usually people who are artistic and creative people who are musically inclined, people who write or are composers. You can see it in, in society, like through the, the genre of the music industry or the, the, the authors, tend towards the melancholy type of temperament. They're thoughtful, considerate, cautious, organized, an excessive planner, schedule-oriented, detailed, highly creative in poetry, art, and invention, independent, good at preventing problems, but they can be obsessive, too cautious, prone to depression, prone to moodiness, perfectionistic, pessimistic, difficult to please, deeply affected by tragedy, a person with tunnel vision, sometimes a procrastinator, discontent with themselves and others, prone to play the martyr. And, um, Melancholy people tend to be uh, artistic and, and musically inclined because they're Cause usually think. deep thinkers and they're, yeah. they're into themselves a lot. And right. they, not, they don't like being around a lot of people. But they can wallow. Yeah. They can wallow in that place of depression or take on the burdens of the world and it's so heavy and they're like carrying it and uh, they make good. Uh, melancholy people tend to be uh, the activists of the world to some degree with the choleric people. So, so anybody melancholy in here? Melancholic? Oh, definitely. You? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Uh, and mixed, yeah. yeah. If you go back, uh, we don't have time right now because we're, we're a little bit pressured here. So, but if one page forward of that, you'll see that there's a, uh, usually you have a really strong point of a temperament and then part of a second one. And no, so you that's not one page for it. Well a couple of pages. A couple of pages for it. A couple of pages back. But you can, you can peruse, see how they mix. Yeah, you can peruse the whole thing that we when you have time to go over it. Yeah. But the best way, I mean, is to look at this and to analyze yourself and, and to see yourself there and be honest about it. 
And the other thing is, is to ask your mate or to ask your children or to ask your mother or somebody that's within your family, what do you think I am? What, what do I fit here? And, um, and but, instead of trying to change the person, learn to work with what they are. Right. It'll take the edge off. I mean, he finally learned that, yeah. what was that? That's the key. Yeah. yeah it's that, about, that's the key to the whole relationship yeah. right there. Right. Yeah. You have right. to judging learn. Judging for that, for the temperament. Right. 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 Yeah. But I was judged. I was judged terribly. And so hence we got this plant that's like droopy. Yeah. And, but once he learned who I am, I mean, really embrace that this is who God made. This is I am. This is it. how he made us. We're God all different. God loves me like I am. He created me in my mother's womb exactly with all my talents, all my gifting, all my everything about me. Now he's working out a work here to get rid of these rough the edges that I got, the weaknesses that I've got. And you know, Satan will use these weaknesses. This is your flesh. You know, when we're talking about human nature or about your flesh, that's what this is. This yeah, weak, the weakness the side weak is side. the flesh. But once we learn to work together with each other, once we learned about our differences and that one or the other wasn't wrong, we're just different. We needed to blend those two together to work as a team. And mm -hmm. so once we did that, we were good to go uh, on this part, anyways. Yeah. Uh, one of, what? No, uh, where were you gonna go? I was going to, I just wanna make mention of the spiritual gifting because this is another area and I'm not, we're not gonna spend time on that today because that's for a whole full session. We all have a spiritual gift that God has given to us. Yeah, you've got your temperament that you basically inherited through birth and how God knit you together, but then you've been gifted with a spiritual gift and we talk about that from the Romans 12 scripture, which is the proclaimer, the server, the teacher, the exhorter, the giver, the administrator, and the mercy gift. And once we learned that and began to blend the, our giftings together, uh, we were coming to a place of understanding. It was the beginning of the repair for the relationship where I could understand where he was coming from and he could finally understand where I was coming from and give me credit for who I am yeah. and rejoice in who I am and uh, appreciate me as I am. Learning to understand right. who you are. So, so I we, have a, a gentleman that I'm gonna mm. interview today mm. and he's a guest here, his name is Mr. X and he's uh, been so gracious to come and uh, be with us. And he's coming right now. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? How are you guys doing today? Hey, honey, how are you doing? <laughs> Looking good. So this is Mr. X, and he's our guest today. And so I'm interviewing him uh, for this occasion. Mm -hmm. So um, hey, you're looking good too. Huh? Yeah. That's good. You ready? Uh, ready hey. for my questions? What do you What do you need, babe? Okay. Which of these two plants best describes your wife? <laughs> well, this one right here, man, she's a hag, a nag, and a bag all wrapped up in one. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> okay. Why did you marry someone that looks like that? What would ever possess you to, I mean, if you say she's a hag and a bag and a whatever, why would you even go out with her? Why well, would you I, want to be with her? What do you think, I'm stupid, lady? I didn't marry her looking like that. I married her looking like that. She was hot. She was looking real good. That's who I married. She only ended up like this a little later on. I don't know. Well, well, then why do you think she changed? What, what, what transformed her from this to this? What happened in here? Yeah, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't know. This, this woman, she had issues, you know. She had issues before I even came along. So I don't know. You know, I'm not a psychiatrist. Who knows? <laughs> And do you think you had anything to do with her changing from this to this to me? the worst? Me? Yeah, you. <laughs> no, 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 hey, you're not going to hang that on me. No, she had a problem before I even came along. Oh. No, that was... It's not, I, so you're not responsible no, not for any, no. any of this. No. Well, how did you meet your wife? Well, you know, I was uh, out with my buddies drinking. We went to a party. 
<laughs> and uh, we were drinking, and I looked across the room. I saw this young lady over there. Boy, she was hot. Yeah. So I, uh, I had to get my nerve up, you know, so I had a couple more beers. You know, when I get to drinking, uh, the charm really comes on. I don't know what it is about me. When I, the more I drink, the more charming I get. It's like the ladies really can't resist me after. So I went over to her, and uh, I introduced myself, and boy, we hit it right off, man. We had a good time. Yep, it was good. Well, okay, so you met her at a party. Uh -huh. So did you go out with her a lot on oh, dates after that? Yeah. Well, all the time, man. We were out every night, every night going somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, we never stayed home anywhere. I took her out every night. We had a great time, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what did you do on your dates? Oh, we went dancing. Oh, she loved to dance. This lady, not, she'd dance your feet off. She loved to dance. Yeah, every night we danced and danced. Okay. Well, okay, if she loved to dance so much and you're married to her, yeah. do you take her dancing now? Well, no. <laughs> well, no. I, I, well, why not? Well, I mean... She loved to I mean, dance. that was then. I mean, we were dating. You know, I'm married now. What do, I, what do we need to dance for? You know, I don't even like to dance. <laughs> I don't even like it. Um, I have a question. Does your wife work? Oh, yeah. It's all right my wife works, man. I'm not going to have her laying around the house, and, you know, loafing all the time. She's going to earn her keep. She's going to earn her keep, you know. <laughs> Besides, she's making payments on my new bass boat. <laughs> Well, okay, since she works and she's helping make payments on your new bass boat, yeah. do you help her with the housework? What? Help her with the housework? <laughs> That's a woman's job, man. <laughs> no way. I'm not going to help her with the house. What did my buddies say? They knew I was cleaning house. No way. <laughs> no. But you know what? What? You know, since she's been working, she's really letting the house go. I'm going to have to get on her for that. Yeah. yeah. yeah she's letting I'm it go. Sure. I'm telling you what. The house is dirty, it's unkept. No, oh, she's, she's really slipping up. I'm gonna have to get on her for that. Well, do you ever tell your wife that you appreciate her? I mean, for working and trying to clean house and do all this appreciate stuff? Her? Appreciate her? Yeah. She needs to appreciate me. <laughs> I mean, you know, she doesn't know what she's got. I mean, take a look at this. I mean, this is a prize. There's a lot of <laughs> women that like to have a husband like this one. No, 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 she needs to learn to appreciate me. Well. Do you tell your wife that you love her? Do you, do you say that you love her? I mean, surely you said that when you dated her. Do you tell her now? No, well, you know, I don't get into that mushy stuff too much, you know. <laughs> you know, I, it's too mushy for me. You know, I'm, besides, I told her I loved her enough when I was dating her. I, I don't see the need now. Well, what, do you love your wife? Do, do I love, love my her? wife? <laughs> Three times a week, just like clockwork. Just like clockwork. I come home from work, she says that look in my eye, she knows what I want. Yeah. You know, but you know, I don't know, lately, she's getting a little frigid on me. I don't know what's going on. You know, she seems, seems to have a lot of headaches. I don't know. I think maybe she's gonna have to take some vitamins or something. Well, what do you do when your wife starts to cry because you've hurt her feelings? Do you? Do anything? Do you take care of that? Well, do let me just tell you, lady, when she starts that stuff on me, it makes me mad because, you know, that's, she's trying to manipulate me with the tears. So I don't allow that crap at all. You know, when she starts with the crying stuff, I just tell her to shut up. You know, wow. that seems to work pretty good. Wow. Yeah. In the area of communication, you know, that would be talking one-to-one -one here. In the area of communication, what do you and your wife talk about? Do you have subjects you talk about? Do you talk? Well, let me, let me tell you something, lady. I talk all day. <laughs> At work, I talk all day. When I come home, I don't want to talk anymore. I'm done talking. <laughs> you know, she needs to learn to give me a little space. But you know, she wants to, she always wants to talk. When I want to relax, be quiet, she comes, she starts her nagging. Nag, nag, <laughs> nag, 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 nag. I'm not happy about this. I'm not happy about this. This is broken over here. You need to fix that. I, you know, I get sick of it. So I just tell her, shut up. You know, I was talking to the guys at work the other day. Tell them the problem I was having with my wife, Nagin. They gave me a little hint on what to do. He says, you know, when my wife does that to me, I just haul over and smack her one. He says, you ought to try that. That'll shut her up. Wow. 
that's like crazy over the you top. You know, well, you know for what? For not wanting to you talk. You know what? I don't have to do that to my wife. All I got to do is just raise my hand like this. That oh. shuts her right up. Yeah. Should try it, guys. Works pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Since I've listened to this interview and it's like shocking. Uh, what do you think needs to change for your marriage to be happy again? I mean, do you, do you want to change? change anything? I'll tell you what needs do to you, change, little, you, little, little one here. <laughs> I'll tell you what needs to change. She's the one who's got to do the change. Oh. Yeah? Because she just, she just disrespects me. You know, and, you know, and she needs to respect me. You know, even God backs me up on that. You know, and that's, that's the problem. That's where she needs to change. She needs to read some books, understand how to take care of me like she should be as a wife. So, yeah, she's the one who needs to change. Well, based on everything that you've said, do you think this marriage is going to survive? Ah, uh, nah. <laughs> Well, why would I want to rescue that? You know, look at it. It's done. No, I got nothing. I don't see why I need to do anything. Yeah, I think it's long gone. Uh, she's an old bag. Besides that, I got this little filly at work. She's been looking at me, and she's been talking to me. And I'm telling you what, you know, I'm thinking this might be the one that's going to know how to take care of me. So, yeah, I think I'm going to get rid of the old lady here, and I'm not going to pick up on this other one. I think she's going to want that's going to treat me right. Well, and you're sure that she's not broken? And Hey, we'll find that out when we get there, huh? Right. Okay. So, Adios. I'm done with this. You seriously? I'm done with the this. The interview? Yeah, you're, okay. You're making me mad. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think? Mr. X needs some help here, <laughs> serious help. So he's not far off the mark. Well, from a lot unfortunately, of <clears throat> over the years, I've heard a lot of these same comments made by men in the church about their wives. That's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. So this is something that, that goes on every day. I know I exaggerated to some degree. But you get the point. You know, marriage is important. God wants us to learn how to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's how I learned to take her from this back to this again. I learned agape love. I learned sacrificial love. I learned what it was I needed to do in order to love my wife from this back to this again. And that's what we're going to share as we go on with more series. We have, we have some deeper, deeper things to go into. Yeah, we're just snorkeling right now. We've only we're been snorkeling. snorkeling the last couple times. We're going to start scuba diving here in the next lesson or two. We're going deep, and we're going to discuss things that, that will just absolutely transform your life and your marriage. So we're looking forward to more opportunities here to share it with you. And... Uh, at this point, you know, we're done with this particular session.